I've got a very special guest with us today on the Imagine AI Live podcast, Mark Heaps. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So Mark Heaps just finished a presentation at our event. Yep. First of all, how is the Imagine AI Live event going so far? It's our inaugural debut here. You know, it's always it's a, always a little like unnerving to go to a brand new event and wonder like who will be there, how many people will be there. I have to say this has been spectacular. You guys have done a great job. The crew's been amazing. The stage looks gorgeous. The questions from the attendees are highly qualified. They're, they're really engaged. So I think it's been great. Well, thanks so much for that. Yeah. And, and so you are Grok's chief evangelist, is that right? Yeah, chief tech evangelist. And then I'm also the VP of brand and creative. Wow. And that's a little bit different than what most people would think of a brand group where you would think of oh, that's just like corporate marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but my team is actually heavily integrated in product development. We have engineering conversations. We work with the sales teams. We work with the cloud teams. Mm -hmm. So brand is kind of a central hub within the company. Mm -hmm. And we, we really touch everything. And when did you join Grok? Four years ago. Wow. Uh, actually, I was a vendor of Grok. Um, okay. I was brought in to support the CEO. Uh -huh. um, my wife owned an agency and we came in to kind of help them with some of their materials and some of their messaging and, and also just being a technologist myself. I geeked mm -hmm. out on what they were building. And then I was completely drawn into what Jonathan and the team were doing. Jonathan Ross, our CEO, the way I described it to my wife was I haven't felt this engaged or stimulated since my time at Apple. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like they had something really special and I wanted to be a part of that and see if I could contribute more to it. So I actually left working for my wife and her business and uh, joined Grok. Great, and, and so what's the 30 second elevator pitch for Grok? You know, really it's about the AI application development for people that want real time AI inference, meaning you wanna have the world's fastest performance for your application. Mm -hmm you should run it on the Grok LPU inference engine. And so the LPU is our proprietary chip. It's a language processing unit. Mm -hmm. And we make everything faster and more performant. It's been crazy for Grok in the recent months. There's been a lot of news, a lot, a lot of, of virality. Yeah. Yes. And could you uh, highlight some of those, the big moments over the last uh, quarter, let's say, of... Yeah, there, there was a couple of events that happened, right? And it was an eight-year overnight success, as <laughs> uh, Chamath and the crew said on the All In podcast. Yeah, yeah. But um, the first event actually happened right before Christmas, where we ended up on Hacker News from Y Combinator, and we saw a big spike of traffic and attention. I actually worked all day Christmas Day uh, mm -hmm. for that. And then um, recently, a couple of the influencers from the developer community tweeted about us online and said, you got to check this out. These guys are crazy fast. And it's exploded since then. We also launched our Grok Cloud, which provides API access to the technology. Mm -hmm. In literally the last few weeks, we've got to where we have more than um, 60,000 developers wow. using the API in the playground. Uh -huh. And there's more than 16,000 applications that have already been built that are calling into our services via Grok Cloud. And then to just be part of the community, we created a Discord server like everybody else. <laughs> and now there's six and a half thousand people in the Discord community. So... These last few weeks have been very busy and we're very thankful that the developer community is is welcoming us with open arms. OK, so a little background. I make clips for the All In podcast. Yeah, right, I'm a sure. huge All In podcast fan. And so Chamath was the reason that Grok got on my radar. OK. And have actually made some clips of him talking about Grok and, yeah. and put it on TikTok. I love, I love in the video one of the recent episodes where he's just all Grok. Grok, 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 but um, it was sort of like pouring gasoline on the fire. Yeah. You know, the developer community really got wind of us first and that was giving us attention. And then by him uh, mentioning us in the All In podcast, that just drew more, more attention from the business communities mm -hmm. as an investment. And then we recently acquired Definitive Intelligence and Sunny Madra, who is the CEO and founder of that organization, is also connected to Chamath. Right. And so that brought those two sides and Sunny has his own podcast as well. Uh -huh. And uh, that brought those two sides together and that gained even more attention for us. And for sure. what is Sunny's new role at Grok? So he's the head of Grok Cloud. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So Definitive Intelligence, as we acquired the company, they basically came in and said, we're going to build your cloud platform. 
we'd already started building it in the early days and giving API access, but they've more than 10 X, you know, what we've done in the last few months. Ah. And that's really how we've been able to meet this virality moment mm -hmm. is the work that the team has done. And where is your headquarters? Where are all these chips made? <laughs> yeah. So the headquarters is in Mountain View, California. Uh, we're right on the Castro in Mountain View. So we're in the heart of Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. but we're actually a geoagnostic company. Um, we tell employees that you can work wherever you stand, unless obviously you need to be in a lab. Uh -huh. um, and then we also have a lab in San Jose, California. Most of our compiler software team is in Toronto, Canada. Okay. And then the rest of us are spread out across the US. I'm in Austin, Texas. There's a hand of, handful of us there. Um, we have a team in London, across Europe as well. And then the chips themselves, and this is an interesting part about Grok. Actually, our chips are designed and engineered in North America. So they're fabbed in Malta, New York. They actually go across the border into Canada to have the packaging put around the silicon. And then those come back down into the States. And that's where we actually build out our nodes, our PCI cards, everything. So it's a really interesting part of our business model is you hear all these discussions right now about concerns of manufacturing in Taiwan, right. what's going on with China, et cetera. We don't have any of those concerns. We're completely North America based. Yeah, everything in North America, that's astounding. Yeah. I, I actually live in Seoul, South Korea, and oh, so wow. Samsung chips yeah. is a big competitor in this well, space. Well, and, yeah. and even that, so we've already signed, we did a press release, we've already signed a deal that our next generation tip, our V2 silicon, which will be four nanometer, um, that's being fabbed by Samsung, ah. but it's being fabbed by Samsung in their new Taylor, Texas plant, that which big, is just up the road from my house. Yeah, that big and, plant And there. great next to barbecue. <laughs> um, but that's actually going to happen in Texas. So our V2 will also stay in North America. Wow. So, so much hype, so much excitement. What's next? I mean, how do you just keep building on the momentum? You know, I think it's not on us to keep building the momentum, although certainly we're, we're trying to figure that out <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. But what we really know is it's the developer community, right? Mm -hmm. The developer community is the long tail that does all this innovation. They just build fast, they break things, and then they iterate. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to figure out how to serve them as much as possible. And so that's why we made the API free and people can, you know, develop and build easily, you know, building things that were familiar for mm -hmm. them as a, as a tool set. Outside of that, we have a generational version of our node that it will be coming out in the next several months. That's really more for behind the curtain magic with Grok Cloud, but that will actually give us a bit of a performance improvement again. Mm -hmm. It'll use less power and it gives us a different footprint in the data center, which you know is a, is a huge challenge for people today. Mm -hmm. And then we're working on that V2 silicon, which takes us down to four nanometer and getting that rolled out early next year wow. that we can introduce. So between that and the rate at which models change in the open source community and continuing yeah. to serve them with our compiler, there's no shortage of things for us to do. Do you have a story of a, a developer on your platform that is using it and how they're using it? There's so many. I mean, this is the amazing thing. Like I said earlier, 60,000 plus people in the, yeah, in the cloud with API of, access. Yeah. It's a lot. We love that people are tweeting little screenshots showing us what they're building. Mm -hmm. I showed one earlier from a developer whose name is Philippe and he has a, an app called Cassillian. And I was a college professor for seven years and he's got this amazing kind of Wikipedia node based uh, learning topic tool that you literally type in, what do you want to learn? What's your general goal? And what's your background? Like, you know, how experienced are you with mm -hmm. it already? And it will completely build out a node interface of all the topics as a lesson plan. And then when you click on that, it opens up a document that it generates from the LLM of exactly the steps and process you need to learn. That's insane. That's it's amazing. unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, if teachers get a hold of that, it completely changes the environment of how you learn. Mm -hmm. Those things are really exciting. And then there was one that was done. I can't remember his name right now. I want to say it was Alexi. Uh, it might be the guy from the Thursday I podcast. But he had this really cool demo where one model was allowing you to drag in a word to a node editor and you could stack the nodes mm -hmm. and then it would write a new word. And then it was using that to generate an image in the background. And so he was running that LLM that does the prompt development on Grok and the speed at which it was generating new visuals based mm -hmm. on those prompts was just such a cool tool. You know, and again, I don't know how anyone would use yeah. it, but I think that's not the point right now. I think the point they're, right they're now is it. invent things that inspire people and they'll figure out where it can be applied. And this is this has always been like a Google method, right? Let's build technology and then figure out where it fits in the product schema of things. And so right now we just want to keep enabling folks and, you know, there's a lot of great partners out there. Yeah. I remember Chamath talking about how it's, it's really where the developers go. That's where the energy goes yes, and absolutely. to have 60,000 people building. That's, that's great. And then the yeah. discord community as well. That's, yep. 
I'm going to have to ask for uh, access to that. Is that is it open to? Yeah, it's totally open. People can go in there right now um, in the lower corner of our website. There's a Discord link on there. Mm -hmm. You can see the little badge like everybody has. And you can click and join in there. And then the team actually monitors that all day long. And they're asked, answering yeah. questions. And now we're about to roll out a program. We don't know the official titles yet. For the people that are really active in there, you know, they're going to be considered Grok champions. And there will be Grok experts. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing it. There's a, there's a young man. I think they said he was 16 out of Germany. And he's answering more questions to the community than we are. <laughs> and he's helping them get their applications built. And he's answering questions about the playground. That's amazing. It's yeah. totally amazing. So... Clearly the theme for us for the rest of the year is how do we support them? How do we mm -hmm. enable them? How do we fuel their fire? How do mm -hmm. we help them stay inspired? And we know that the speed is the first ingredient of that. Yeah. Well, uh, touching on that, I mean, that's your competitive advantage, right? It's, that's totally the differentiator for sure. Yeah. And there's many actually. Uh -huh. um, this was one of the mistakes we made early on as a business is we tried telling everybody all the advantages, all the differentiators. Clearly it confused people. So when we started thinking about this at the beginning of 2023, we decided as a business, you know, what is the, the primary differentiator that we need to lean into the most? Mm -hmm. Clearly, the biggest problem statement for a lot of AI applications was low latency. Mm -hmm. And we know from the papers published by the incumbents that they have a ceiling on low latency. Mm -hmm. Graded a lot of other things, but that was a problem statement that was very clear. So we decided to lean in the most to that. But there's a lot of different value props. The other value props, if you had to say the second or third one? Yeah. I mean, if, if you think about enterprise, mm -hmm. um, scalability is a big one, right? This is one of the things that happens with low latency performance on a typical oh. GPU system is that once you start getting every eight chips, mm -hmm. you start seeing the latency actually drop off, which mm -hmm. is why they tend to focus on higher batch sizes and similar. Um, we are completely linear scalable. And I know that's a marketing term that every company loves to use, but we truly are. And people can read our papers on this you can scale our architecture up to thousands of chips and not lose performance. And wow. so for us, we can really serve the enterprise at scale. When you talk about thousands to hundreds of thousands of users, mm -hmm. beautifully. The other part for us is the efficiency. So we designed and developed all of our own chip to chip connection technology. Mm -hmm. um, we call this real scale. So in our network topology, we don't use the same devices that a traditional data center would use. We don't have the switches and the routers and a lot of things that are fail stages in the systems. Mm -hmm. And by reducing those, we've reduced the bottlenecks and become more efficient in the power footprint once you're at scale. Mm -hmm. So really the key for us as I guess the second value prop is scalability. And then the third one is we don't use CUDA and we don't use kernels. So because all of the models are built into our compiler, time to production is very fast. When Llama 1 first got leaked, we literally had it up and running in a couple of days and deployed to production. And we've done that for a number of customers where they've said, hey, this would normally take us months to get mm -hmm. it moved into production. We've typically been able to move people into production in less than a week. From an environmental standpoint, your chips consume less energy. It's uh, less of a carbon footprint on the planet. Yeah, it's a complicated topic, actually. So the chip itself uses a little bit more electricity than a lot of other GPUs, A100s and okay. things like that. Now, the new chip that just came out, the B100 from NVIDIA, that, uh -huh. that uses more than us. But what happens is once you start deploying this at scale and you gain those efficiencies at scale, the footprint at the data center or enterprise scale were actually much more efficient. Okay. So this is where the industry has typically looked at a spec sheet and said, okay, chip to chip, how do these compare? Uh-huh. But when you think about actually deploying into production environments, we're much more efficient at scale. And it's because one of the main reasons is how data moves across the chip. The way that the architecture was designed means that you're not doing all of this scheduling and managing and leaving it in RAM yeah. and then moving it back out. We're much more efficient in the compute. Yeah. And you can do much more with the same amount of energy because it's that's exactly better. right that's exactly right and what's really cool about this is you know we're often compared in the industry to the latest and greatest from the gpu providers mm -hmm. right and there's a place for them we think they're great but what's really interesting is we're being compared and we're using 10 year old silicon fabrication uh or fab processes so we're on 14 nanometer you know that was released by the fabs you know more than 10 years ago uh -huh. we're being compared to people that are at four nanometer wow so what we're doing with Samsung is we're moving to four nanometer for our next generation chip. Uh -huh. If we did nothing at all, this would literally just brute force scale it down. We would literally see a three X performance improvement 
while we also use 3x less power. And so that efficiency is the way that you want to see the chip developers going versus what we just heard from recent announcements is the next generation of GPUs are going to use even more power still. And because of the architecture, they're still not going to solve the low latency problem. Mm -hmm. They're going to be killer at what they're great at, graphics, training, et cetera. But we want to see the technology groups figuring out ways to get faster and become more power efficient because the carbon footprint from data centers is a hot topic. Yeah. Well, Mark Heaps, I've got one more question sure. for you. You said you were a professor for seven years. Yeah. What was your... Uh, so actually, I, uh, I taught at multiple colleges, but I mostly taught graphics design and production media, things like that. So I was a senior image expert at Apple and okay. uh, I worked in the Lava Lounge production team there for a while. And then I went to an agency that served Apple remotely. And so my background was always in graphics. Wow. But um, I was always a technologist. I actually started way back in the 80s programming for graphics uh-huh. and, and building things out direct from code. I had a Spectrum 48K and then a Commodore and a Tandy. And, wow. and I built it all from then. So I was deeply knowledgeable in like rendering, ray tracing, you know, channel bit depth, et cetera. I, I, I can get pretty geeky on it. I've, I think I've contributed to like about, nine books. How about video the, games? Do you play video games? I do play video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a 12 year old son, so I think okay. it's required that I play video nice. games. I would love to have you on again on sure. the podcast, uh, maybe a month or so from now on the a full version yeah. and uh, talk some more. It's been great talking with you. Thank you for coming to our inaugural event. And uh, it's, been it's great. a pleasure having you here. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.